Uh, tonight our topic is the will of God, and we're using David. I've never done it quite this way. A lot of what I teach here I've done before, but I've done it in different settings. But this is new. I've just sort of, as I've been reading through David's life, one of the themes is how he inquired. That's the key word. He inquired of the Lord. What should I do? Um, I like to start with stories. Did you hear about the, uh, the guy who was trying to find God's will for the day and he liked to use the Bible roulette method? You know, that's where you just open the Bible and put your finger down and say, okay, God, what do I do? And he turned one morning and he hit, put his finger on the verse that said, Judas went out and hanged himself. And so he said, well, that's not good. Let me try this again. He flipped through the pages again and put his finger down and it said, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> and he didn't like that. So he said, I think I better try again. And he did it again. And he landed on the verse, and what thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> How not to find the will of God. But there are a lot of tragic stories. And... Uh, of people who assume they know. And I gave you one at the beginning. In Claremont, France, Pope Urban II showed up and preached a very famous sermon on November the 27th, 1095. I mean, that's a long time ago. Um, 900 years. And his famous phrase was, I don't know how to say the Latin, Deus vult. And supposedly, the, which means God wills. God wills it. God will, and the whole thousands of people started chanting, God wills it. Anybody know what they were saying? This was the first crusade. The blank there is this became the battle cry of the first crusade. God wills it. It's very famous in history. And the Pope had said, Jerusalem has fallen to the Turks and the Turks are killing Christians and stealing money, and raping women, and somebody must do something, we must go and fight. And everybody said, God's wills, God wills, God wills. Did he? I don't know. We can debate, but it, it raises the whole question of how do you know the will of God? Uh, the bullets there, does God have a plan for our lives? And if he does, how detailed is it? You know, it's one thing to say God calls someone into medicine, but does he care what pants you put on this morning when you made the choice in your closet? Um, how detailed is this plan? If he does have a plan for my life, how can I know it? How do you know the will of God? Is it Bible roulette? I mean, is that how you know it? Do you hear voices? How do you do it? If God wills it, then am I free? This raises the whole, well, if it's the will of God, why don't I just go limp? Because if God wills to get Jerusalem back, where do I come into the picture if it's his will? So there's a lot of questions involved in this, and it's one thing to ask this question when you're like 16. It's another thing when you're 62. Uh, it's at different seasons of life, this question, I thought I figured this out, you know. Did, do I understand God's will? B, David's life, this leads us to Davis, has much to teach us about discerning and doing the will of God. On numerous occasions in the Psalms, we find David meditating. I'm just, and I write these things down so I don't have to spend much time with you on them, okay? So you've just got them. But the Psalms have a lot to say about the will of God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Anybody know what the next phrase is? It's one of my favorite verses. The ESV is unite my heart. The NIV is give me an undivided heart. I 
I think Amy Grant's got a song about an undivided heart, doesn't she? I don't, I hope, um, I was going to say I hope she has one. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. Um, but unite my heart to fear your name. Number two, good and upright is the Lord. That was Psalm 86. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads who? The humble. Proud people don't learn the will of God. Humble people are candidates for knowing his will. Or number three is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me. I almost, almost had us sing tonight the hymn, He leadeth me, O oh, blessed thought. These, these are songs I grew up with, and I don't hear them anymore. Um, he leads me beside still waters. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You're with me. Your rod and staff is how a shepherd guides sheep. It might nudge them. It might discipline them. But they're a comfort to David because you're keeping me in the path. Number four, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. We're going to see when we look at David's life that counsel and counselors were a big part of how do you discern God's will? Well, what voices are you listening to? Number five, I, I love this one, Psalm 32. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye, not my hand. God says, yeah, let me keep going. With my eye upon you, be not like the horse or mule <laughs> without understanding. They need a bit and bridle. But if you're really my child, it's just my eye. When I catch your eye, you've got all the guidance you need. You don't need a whip. You don't even need a bridle. Just my eye. That's, that's powerful. That's face-to-face. -face. That's intimacy. Okay, so we're just introducing the theme. Now, number two, David's life is a magnificent illustration of what it means to know and do and to not know and not do the will of God. Surveying his entire, the entirety of his life, we see several themes. So what we're doing tonight is not studying one passage, but about two books of the Bible, First and Second Samuel, and trying to pull out the places where David either got guidance or didn't get guidance, or maybe... We're not sure if he did or not. Okay? For example, A, there were times when God's will was sovereignly, and I'm going to use the word imposed, on David's life. Most notably, when Samuel showed up at his house and basically put his finger in his chest and said, you're the next king. I think David just said, I'm just taking care of my sheep, man. I'm not even asking that question. I'm... And suddenly, God's will is sovereignly there. There are types of God's will where that's the case. It's just, it's there. I accept it. I'm not even sure you can reject it. Could David have said no? That's a very interesting question. Theoretically, certainly, he could have said to his brothers and the whole town watching. I, I, but it's sort of you get the impression you don't really, God's not asking if you want to do this. He's telling you. So that's part of the story. Uh, B, there were times when David, there were other times when David actively sought to know God's will. Or perhaps... Learned God's will through a prophet. I'm going to ask you, now if you'll look on the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to 13. Just to reassure you, I don't have any blanks in there. So you're not missing anything. You've got all the, you've got all the data. But I want you to take your Bible. 
I do better if I see this in Scripture than if I'm reading it off a page. So let me just flip through. We're going to start at 22. And I want to just introduce you to a theme. And I've learned in Bible study, once you begin to see something, once you begin, then you, you'll always see it. You don't need me. You'll just see it and say, oh, there it is. David's seeking the will of God. He's seeking the will of God. So 1 Samuel 22, verse 5. And we're doing these quickly. This is when he's in the cave at Adullam. And the prophet Gad, he's a prophet. Prophets speak for God. His name is Gad. He shows up two or three times in David's life. Said to David, do not remain in the stronghold. Depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went to the forest. So we've got guidance from God that comes through a prophet that he obeys. Look at verse 15 in the same chapter. This is when Saul brings the priest Ahimelech who has been accused of helping David. Yes? Oh, the password is... Oh, yeah. Good. And Ahimelech says, verse 15, Is today the first time that I have inquired of God for David? No, let not the king impute anything to his servant, to all the house of my father, for your servant has known nothing of all this. The point is... David came many times to the tabernacle and the priest to inquire, that's the key word, of God. What should I do? If you've got a heart like God's heart, one of the manifestations is, I want to know what God wants. It's sort of a reflex. Keep going. Uh, chapter 23, verses 1 to 5. Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore, David, what? He inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and ask, attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said, Behold, we're afraid here in Judah. How much more if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord again, and the Lord again said, Go. So uh, David inquires of the Lord. Anybody know how he did that? How, do you, how, did, how is David asking the Lord? Look at verse... Um, Twenty-three verse, yeah, twenty-three verse six. The next verse. Yeah, I'm, I'm too easy. When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David in Keilah, he had come down with an ephod. What's the ephod? Hesitant answers it. This is what the high priest wore. It was like a breast piece, and in the ephod of the priest's garment in the breast piece there was a pouch and in the pouch were two stones probably stones they could have been shells they could have been bones they could have been pieces of wood anybody know what they were called the urim and thummim uh, the urim and thummim if you know it's and nobody knows exactly what they looked like or what they were, or even what the words Ermin and Thummim mean. They're plural, with the I-M on the end means plural. But they were like dice of some kinds where you cast lots to determine God's will. This makes most of us a little nervous. It's like, wow, that's, that's, that's a little hokey. <laughs> that's a little different. But it's, it's a part of the Old Testament record. It's a part of the New Testament record. We're going to see, yeah, 
they cast lots to determine who would replace Judas. I'll go ahead and say there's no record that says that was the right or wrong thing to do, and the person they chose to replace Judas, I, probably nobody here even remembers his name. He was pretty in, inconsequential. It was Matthias, wasn't it, or Mattathias? Um, and a lot of people think, well, they didn't need to do that because God already had chosen the apostle Paul to be the apostle. But there's no comment on the rightness or wrongness. It just says this was a way to give a decision, take it out of my hands, and put it in God's hands by, by finding a, a way to cast lots. But that's how David was seeking God on some of these things, when Abiathar was there particularly. Um, yeah, verse 9 uh, David knew that Saul was plotting against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod. Then said David, O Lord, God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, He'll come down. Then David said, Will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They'll surrender you. Then David and his men, who were 600 men, arose and departed. So he's seeking the will of God. Let's keep moving and we'll get stuck on some of these. Look at chapter 20, no, 30. This is what Katie led us in last week, the worst day of David's life. Verse, chapter 30, verse 6, David was greatly distressed. The people spoke of stoning him because the people were bitter in soul. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. Verse 7, and David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David and David inquired of the Lord. Shall I pursue? God said, pursue. Are you with me? So, and apparently, using the ephod, using the umen and thumim, he was discerning the will of God. The point here is not the method at the moment, okay? The point is he's seeking God. I want to know what God wants me to do. And you see it over and over and over in David's life. Um, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 2. 2 Samuel 2, verse 1. After this, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said, Go up. And David said, To which city shall I go? And the Lord said, To Hebron, or Hebron. Look at chapter 5, verse 19 of 2 Samuel. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, I will give them into your hand. Verse 22, And the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, You shall not go up, but go around to their rear and come against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourself, for the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the Philistines. And David did as he was commanded. So that's pretty specific. It's not just attack them. It's go around and back, listen for the sound of the wind and the balsam trees, then you attack. It's like, that's pretty detailed. That's pretty detailed. We're, we're seeing the examples because we're going to try to draw some applications for us, okay? Um, chapter 7. This is an interesting one. Chapter 7, verse 1. Now, when King David lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all of his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan, the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, because the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house? 
And there's a long passage that basically God says, okay, I know Nathan, first of all, told you to build my house, but now I'm saying, nope, not you, your son is going to build my house. But he's seeking the will of God through the prophet. Um, chapter 12, verse 15. This is a very sad one. Chapter 12, verse 15 is when David and Bathsheba have their little rendezvous. A baby is born. The baby gets sick. And it says in verse 16, David sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in all and lay all night on the ground. And if you remember the story, the child dies. He seeks God. He's looking for a yes from God. God says, no, the child dies. But he's seeking God in all of this. Um, look at chapter 16, verse 5. We're almost... Oh, this one's so interesting. This is when Absalom, his son, leads a rebellion... David is fleeing for his life from his own palace because his son is trying to kill him. And when David came to Bahurim, this is verse 5 of chapter 16, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gerah. As he came, he cursed continually, and he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And Shimei said as he cursed, Get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you. You're a man of blood. Then Abishai, the son of Zuriah, said to King David, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go take his head off. <laughs> you have to love these stories. And King David said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zuriah? If he is cursing because the Lord said to him, Curse David, who shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more... May this Benjamite leave him alone and let him curse because the Lord told him to. Very interesting. But again, his whole point is, what is God, not what do I want in this, what is God doing? Where is God speaking? Maybe he can even speak to me through somebody who's cursing and throwing dirt at me. Wow. Wow. David, you're, you think different than most of us think. That's exactly right. He's got a heart like God's heart. Um, let me stop with that. There's, there's others here when the famine came, etc. But the point, over and over and over we see this theme. David seeks God, the will of God. What does God want? That's the point, and that's why, what I want you to see. I'm, I'm at letter C on the back here. So we've been seeing there are times when David seeks God and he gets direction. But see, there are also times when David seemed to intuitively know, the blank there, intuitively know what God wanted when there's no indication that he first stopped and inquired of the Lord. For example, when Goliath, the story of Goliath, there's no indication that David said, time out, I need to go ask God what I'm supposed to do. David basically looked around and said, where's my sling? Where's my sling? I know what I'm supposed to do. I don't need to ask. The other time is when, on two occasions, David had the chance to kill King Saul. And his men told him, God gave him into your hands. And David said, no, he didn't. I'm not supposed to. How did he know that? Why didn't he go pray about it or go to the priest or get the ephod? There are times he was walking so close to God he just knew. 
Are you with me? We're building a case here. How do we discern the will of God? Do we have to pray over everything? Do we intuitively know things? Look at D. There are times, this is the most interesting one, when there is no indication that David stopped and inquired of the Lord and the decisions he made were questionable at best. For example, and you can look them up on your own time, but number one, when he fled to the Philistines the first time. It just says he went to the Philistines Things went really badly, and that's when he had to pretend that he was insane, and he let the, the spittle drool down his beard. He was acting insane. It's like, what was that all about? And why are you with the Philistines anyway? Well, there's no indication he prayed and that God said, go there. David just went there. Is it right or wrong? I don't know. The Scripture doesn't tell me if it was right or wrong. And frankly, that's sort of true to life. There's a lot of things in life. It's like, how did this happen? <laughs> how did I get here? I, I don't quite know. Uh, number two, when he plans to kill Nabal. This is when he met Abigail. Nabal insults him. And David just says to his men, put on your swords. And he starts riding. And he's going to kill and Abigail steps in the middle of it and says, if you kill that foolish man who I'm married to, you'll be breaking the law of God. And you'll have blood guilt on your hands when you ascend to the throne. And David basically fell on his face and said, thank you, Abigail. You saved me from doing something really stupid that I didn't ask any. I just said, put on your sword. Okay, you with me? Uh, number three, when he fled to the Philistines the second time, the Bible simply says, then David said in his heart, there's nothing better for me than to go live with the Philistines. He just thought that up all by himself. It's one of those things, well, it seemed like a good thing at the time, which is supposedly the reason Napoleon gave for invading Russia. <laughs> when somebody said, why would you invade Russia? He said, well, I don't know. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Number four, when he chose his wives, this is very interesting. He married Michael, Ahinoam, Abigail, and Bathsheba. And there's no indication that he stopped and said, Lord, is this your will or not? Yes. He chose her. It's in chapter 25. He killed his, her husband, and then now that she's a widow, she's marryable. No, I'm talking about Michael, the daughter of Saul. Oh, Saul. Yeah, it was Saul's daughter that he got for, for killing the wife. It's like, who, what am I going to get for doing yeah. this? Yeah. And I thought maybe she was just the door prize. Yes, she was the door prize. That is true. She loved him. She did love him. And, and I'm not saying, my point here is not that he did wrong. It just, I'm not sure what he didn't, it doesn't say he asked some of the, particularly Bathsheba. We know that wasn't the will of God, but they gave birth to Solomon, the next king. It's like, well, what's that all about? How did Solomon come out of that union? What is the will of God? That's, this is my point. It just get life is sort of messy. And sometimes we're right on target, sometimes we're way off target, and sometimes we're not quite sure. Well, I didn't know he had a chance to say, no, thanks, no, thanks, I don't really want your daughter. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I think, yeah, it, it's back in chapter, you can read, yeah, let's keep going. Yeah, let's keep going. When, number five, when he brought the Ark of Covenant to Jerusalem, and I hope we'll have time to study this. I'm still not sure what we're going to study. This is when he put it on an ark. They're having a huge party. Uzzah reaches out to touch the ark because the oxen stumbled and the Lord strikes Uzzah dead. And it just says, and David was furious. Look at it. I want you to see it. Um, it's 2 Samuel chapter 6.
Yeah, verse 8. And David was angry because the Lord burst out against Uzzah. In other words, David thought he knew what God wanted. He thought God would be happy. I'm bringing your ark to Jerusalem. And now our party got spoiled because God killed somebody. What did I do wrong here? Well, he did something very wrong. He didn't carry the ark the way the ark is supposed to be carried. He didn't inquire of the Lord. He usually did, but this time he didn't. And number six, in, um, when he brought Absalom back to the palace, after, a, after Absalom killed his brother to avenge his sister Tamar, who his brother had raped. I mean, talk about sex and violence. If you like sex and violence, I've always told people, just read the Bible. It's, it's better than Hollywood. But Absalom goes away for about three years because he's a murderer. David just pouts. Finally, David brings him back, but it doesn't say that he prayed about it or that he sought God or sought counsel. It just says he brought him back. And Absalom, coming back to the palace, is like bringing poison into the palace. Absalom is a bad dude. He was a rebellious young man. Okay. E. And I could... I got to keep moving. Notice that David, the David story is intertwined with the story of Saul, who had a very different experience with the will of God. Now, if we had time, each of these stories are interesting. When Saul was elected king, anybody remember how Saul was chosen? By casting lots. David was chosen, the prophet shows up, and the prophet says, you're the man. Saul is chosen, when everybody comes together, they cast lots, and the Benjamites are taken, they cast lots again, and the Matrites, the clan is taken, they cast the lots again, and Saul is taken. And they said, you must be the king. Casting lots, I certainly don't recommend casting lots. It's got some interesting biblical precedent, but nowhere are we told to discern the will of God this way. There are examples of it, but a lot of the examples are like this. Is this right or wrong? Now, God chose Saul. I'm not questioning that, but the methodology of choosing him was very different than David. Or two, twice, though Samuel twice clearly told Saul God's will, Twice, Saul chose to obey. Saul, what, I'm sorry? Not to obey. Oh, not to obey. Is that what I said? Twice chose, Saul chose not to obey. Sorry. You guys are listening. Good, thank you. <laughs> so Samuel comes to the king and says, King, wait seven days till I come to offer the sacrifice. And the king doesn't do it. He panics. And before the prophet arrives, he offers the sacrifice. Second time, Samuel comes to the king and says, Saul, it's time to take vengeance on the Amalekites and they're to be all wiped out. Saul goes to the Amalekites and wipes out most of them. And Saul sh Samuel shows up and says, God's rejected you from being king. You knew the will of God you willfully chose to disobey. You violate what it means to be a king in Israel. A king is one who knows God's will and does it. Or if you don't do it, you repent pretty quick. Doing the will of God is what it's all about. Hell is for people who don't do the will of God. That's precisely what hell is. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, but he who does the will of my Father. Number three. When, and yeah, in chapter, turn to 1 Samuel 28. Let's look at this one. Okay, we're going to, 
We've got five more minutes, and then we're going to start making the application. But look at this one. We're looking at Saul because the Saul story is interspersed with the David story. So with David, you're getting some good indications on how to seek God's will. With Saul, you're finding how not to do it. Um, Chapter 28, are you there with me? This is 1 Samuel. In those days the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. Verse 3, skip down to verse 3. Now Samuel had died. Now if you're Saul, Samuel is your only contact with God because you don't have a personal relationship with him. You don't know how to pray, but you know the prophet. He he helped me be king. He can help me find out what God wants. But Samuel's dead. So what do you do? And all Israel had mourned for Samuel and buried him in Ramah. And Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. What's a necromancer? You know the word necro. What is your Bible? What are your translations? A spiritist? But specifically, what's a necromancer? N-E-C-R-O, that's a root that means what? Dead, yeah. If some, dead, and a necromancer is somebody who consults the dead. They know how to bring the dead back and talk to them. A spiritist, a witch. I, um, I mean, if you want to read a good story, if you don't celebrate Halloween and your kids are upset, you know, Take them in a room, turn out the light, and read 1 Samuel 28 to them. <laughs> and just say, this is Bible, man. This is good stuff. And it, it's a very interesting story. But, uh, okay. So Samuel's dead. Saul had gotten rid of all the witches and those who consult the dead. And the reason he did is because the law of Moses said those are an abomination to God. That is not permitted in Israel. Saul had enforced that law. The Philistines, verse 4, The Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, And three ways are meant, so he's trying three ways. What are the three ways? Dreams, Urim, that's the Urim and Thummim, or prophets. So Saul is asking God what he should do, but God's not talking. Which is a very interesting scenario. God's given up on Saul. Saul has passed the point of no return. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, or a witch, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there's a witch at Endor. So Saul disguised himself. This is an incredible story. You know, if you remember the rest of the story, he sits down with the witch and she says, who do you want me to call up? He says, Samuel. And she says, you're Saul. She, she, she knew them. There's, there's spirit stuff going on here, whether it's how to interpret it all, we're going to say for another day. But she calls up Samuel, and an apparition appears claiming to be Samuel. Whether it was Samuel or a demon masquerading as Samuel, You can guess as well as I can guess. I'm not sure. But Samuel basically says, what do you want? And and Saul says, the Philistines are attacking. And Samuel says, that's right. And tomorrow, you and your sons are going to be with me. I mean, it is a spooky story. But he's seeking, Saul is seeking God's will. Sort of. Through a witch. So, the other thing is, um, 
Also, I'm back here on F. Notice that the David story is intertwined also with the story of Absalom. So you've got the story of Saul and how does Saul seek divine guidance? Well, he eventually does it with the witch. How does Absalom seek guidance? And this is not just a minor part of the Absalom story. It's a major part. Because when Absalom takes the, the throne, a rebellious young man whose only method of divine guidance was counselors. Not prophets, but counselors. Not priests, but counselors. He leaned especially on Ahithophel, whose counsel, quote, was as if one consulted the word of God. Ahithophel was the guy who counseled Absalom, if you really want to solidify your kingdom, put a tent on top of the palace, take all of your daddy's concubines in that tent and sleep with them one after another so that all of Israel can see you hate your daddy and you're sleeping with his concubines. I told you these stories are just incredible. Now that counsel came from Ahithophel, who King Absalom was listening to, to try to discern from God, what am I supposed to do? Because all of us want divine counsel of some kind, even the most pagan among us. Um, let me finish that. David prayed, yeah, I love this. David prayed that God would turn the count, count, counsel, <laughs> counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. And that's exactly what happened. That may be a good way to pray against our enemies. <laughs> Lord, just may their counsel expose the fools that they are. I, uh, that's, that's an interesting prayer. And um, when Absalom decided that the counsel of Hushai was more to his liking, Ahithophel went out and hanged himself. These, I'm not making these stories up. They're, they're actually in there. Okay. We have 15 minutes, and this is going to work, but let's talk about lessons and hopefully some applications because we've been seeing a lot of material about how David sought God's will, how Saul, how Absalom, sometimes there's prophets, sometimes there's Umen and Thumen, Sometimes it's not clear. What does all this mean, especially for us? A, and this is just sort of a collection of thoughts. God does have a plan for our lives, and often it is more detailed than we imagine. When you hear the sound in the balsam trees, I mean, that's pretty detailed. Let me ask this question. Which is a more important prayer in terms of influencing your life. The, prayer, the big prayer, Lord, where should I go to college? Or the inconsequential prayer, Lord, what kind of television shows and how much should I watch? We tend to think we know what the big questions are and what the little ones are, but I'm not sure we do. God's interested in details as well as big questions. And David understood that. B, even rebels and unbelievers want divine guidance. Usually this means they want to know the future. Why do people go to Madame Rose and have her read their palm or the crystal? Why do they do that? I'm really serious. Why do they do that? Is it because they want to know God? No. But they want God to do something, or the gods, or the spirits. And it's usually, I want to know the future. You know, should I buy a lottery ticket tomorrow? Or should I invest in whatever? I, I, or should I get married to this person or not? They want to know the future so they can personally profit from such hidden knowledge. But God considers all 
occult, O-C-C-U-L-T, which just means hidden, methods of foretelling the future to be an abomination. Using Deuteronomy 18, let's look this up. Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 14. This is, the older I get, the more interesting the Bible becomes. And just when you think something is ancient history, you realize, no, this is happening right now. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. And if our room were a little smaller, I'd be having some of you to read, so it's not just me all the time. But let me, let me just read. And I'd, I'd love some... The translations here are going to be interesting. When you come into the land that the Lord is, your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering... Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer, verse 11, or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless, or the King James says, you shall be perfect before the Lord your God. For these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. Did you know that passage was in there? It's a pretty interesting. Um, the question here on our sheet, why does God forbid these things? Give me a little feedback. Why, why does God say that's a no-no? Okay, it's worshiping a different God. But what if I say, well, I want to pray and use the Ouija board and ask God to use the Ouija board to tell me? I don't want to worship another God. I want to worship the true God, but I want him to use the Ouija board. Is that tempting God? That's a good question. I, I, I'm not, the answer to this is not necessarily obvious. Or, or controlling God. Or controlling God. God. I don't want to listen for your prayers in the other way. Why else? These are good answers. Why else? Why does God say no to this? In what way? It reflects on the character of God. God is holy. Good. You're, you're, okay. Yeah. God is relational. Reading a crystal ball is not a relationship. These blanks on your sheet, let me just tell you some of the Old Testament ways that were used to and mainly interpret the future or to read the future is, is really what you're trying to do. But there was divination. There was child sacrifice. If I sacrifice my child then maybe God will give me what I want. Fortune-telling, sorcery, witchcraft, might be black witchcraft, might be white witchcraft. Balaam, the guy with the talky, talking donkey, he was a sorcerer. He was a mixture of all kinds of stuff. He really... Um, necromancer, consulting the dead. Interpreting omens. And in the Old Testament days, what are some of the things that they interpreted? They would interpret the livers of animals that had been killed or the entrails, the flight of eagles. Uh, in one of the prophets, they talk about throwing arrows, but I think you could take arrows and throw them out. 
And depending on how they fell, that's how you discerned the will of God. In our day, there are things like tarot cards, astrology, which of course is not Ouija boards, crystal balls. It's this passion, Lord, can, I, can you tell me the future? It's not, can you reveal your face to me? But can you help me control my life so that I benefit? And that's Saul. That is Saul. Let me tell you, look up 1 Samuel 15. We're not going to get through all this, but this is 1 Samuel 15. You've got it. When I have you look up a verse, hopefully it helps it stick. Verse 23. This is the main passage when Saul was rejected because he knew the will of God and he chose not to do the will of God. And in verse 23, Samuel says to Saul, rebellion is like what? It's like divination. It's like witchcraft. And I can remember when I first read that verse, I said, come on, you mean disobedience is similar to consulting a witch? No. And yet that's exactly where Saul ended up, consulting witches. Because when we don't know how to consult, inquire of God, we have to find alternatives. Okay. Um, C... Yeah, I'll do these. I'll just fill in the blanks. When we fail to seek God and lean, not learn, but lean on our own understanding, we risk making poor choices, which is to state the obvious. And when you've got a series of poor choices in your life, you end up where Saul does. When you've got a series of good choices in your life, you end up more like David. D, David had some poor choices, but David knew how to repent when he made a poor choice. Saul just self-destructed. He just, he couldn't handle it. Though God is sovereign and will accomplish his ultimate purposes one way or the other, we have freedom to say yes or no to God's plan. Saul knew God's will Saul said no to God's will. Um, E, when we seek God, we need to recognize that no is just as much of an answer as yes. (laughs) Saul said, I prayed three times God would take the thorn in the flesh away from me. And God answered me three times. No, no, no. In Gethsemane, God the Son prayed three times, let this cup pass. And God the Father said, no, no, no. That's an answer. I can remember when my children, I would tell them no to something, and they would come back and ask me again and say, you didn't answer my question. And I'd say, no, I did answer your question. I did answer. Um, God will not be mocked when we are willfully living in disobedience in one area of our lives, then he will not reveal his will to us in another area of our lives. And again, that's Saul. Lord, help me with the Philistines. And God says, but you didn't obey where you knew my will. Why would I reveal new truth to you? When our wi- H, when our wills are surrendered and we are indwelt by the Spirit, then in many decisions we have no need for guidance. We intuitively know what is right. And we already have the capacity to choose. I love the thought that even as a teenager, David didn't have to pray about fighting Goliath. He just knew, that's, that's my enemy. That's my job. Um, And you know that when your heart is pure. When your heart is pure. 
God reveals His purposes for our lives in numerous ways. One, Scripture. I love this quote of A.W. Tozer. Never seek guidance on what God has already forbidden. Never seek guidance on what God has already commanded. Number two, the indwelling spirit. David was filled with the spirit. God was with him. And Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you. Three, prophets, priests, and counselors. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Number four, dreams. I'm just going to let you fill in these things and you can work on them. But look how many people in the scriptures God spoke to in dreams. Jacob, Joseph, Daniel, Samuel, Solomon. And then in the New Testament, Zacharias, Joseph, Ananias, Peter, Paul, John. And God even spoke to unbelievers like Abimelech, Pharaoh, and Pilate's wife. <laughs> Pretty interesting list of people. I don't think we want to dismiss God's ability to speak in dreams. And if you know what's happening in the Muslim world, you hear lots of stories of God speaking today to Muslims in dreams. Number five, and I've got put a question mark by this one, but circumstances. This is a tricky one to read. Gideon's fleece. I just put a question mark there. This is an interesting quote from Philippians. I want you to know that what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. Circumstances are important, but interpreting them is a big question mark. And you can put three question marks maybe on the whole Urim and Thummim and there is one example of casting lots in the New Testament. That's when they replaced Judas. But there's no encouragement to continue such a practice. The real challenge in the will of God is not knowing it, but doing it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I've given you two verses there at the end on making it personal. Let me just read them and we'll close. The, um, two, they're just hard to beat. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is A. Trust in the Lord with a large portion of your heart. This verse is an incredible verse. With all your heart, do not lean on your own understanding. The Bible has a special word to call people who lean on their own understandings. Anybody who know, knows what that word is? A fool. I gave you that reference somewhere. Uh, yeah, right below there. Um, in all your ways, know him. Most translations say acknowledge him, but the word is know, it's the relationship. Not know about him, know him. And when you trust with all your heart, don't lean on your own understanding, and you know him in all your ways, here's his promise. He'll direct your steps. He will direct your steps. There may be moments you need to go away and pray and seek guidance on something, but I think mostly guidance comes because God's just, I being in the way, the Lord led me. Because my heart was right. And the other verse is that B... On the last page, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. So do you see the progression? How do you discern the will of God? You present your bodies. That's come to a place of total surrender. You do not be conformed to this world. And you be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Then, when Goliath steps on your field, you'll know what to do. (laughs) You'll know what to do. I think that's what the promise is. I've raised more questions than I've answered, but I hope I've got you in the Word and uh, looking not to me, but to the Word for help. Let me pray with you, okay? Lord, this is just where we live, trying to figure out what you want. And we confess sometimes it feels so complicated And Lord, sometimes it's easier than we ever imagined. And we don't know what to do with all those feelings. Lord, sometimes we have to seek, ask, and knock. And Lord, sometimes it's just right in front of us. But Lord, whatever we understand about your will, we confess tonight that the real problem is not in trying to figure out the parts of your will that we don't understand, but it's obeying those parts of your will that we do. Lord, teach us like David, that as we're faithful to obey what we know, you'll continue to reveal more and more truth to us. Show us the way. Thank you that your will is not a mystery, it's not hidden, but you delight to reveal your will to those who truly want to walk in truth. Fill us with your spirit so that as we live, you'll hear a voice behind you whispering each day that says, this is the way, walk in it. For the sake of the kingdom, and in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Good point.